So let's now review quickly what we talked about last Friday. We were part way into talking about plants as an energy source when we ended on Wednesday and I picked that up on Friday. Um, you know, it's, they're hugely important. All of the petroleum that we use are plant-derived materials as a result of photosynthesis on the land. So uh, <clears throat> plants are very important to our energy supply and now of course with things like uh, bioenergy there are serious efforts to try and capture photosynthesis in real time and use it as an energy source to help address energy shortages in the future. We talked about plant-derived medicines, an awful lot of important medicines are plant products. Um, things as common as aspirin. Aspirin comes from the willow. And uh, it's, so there are many plant-derived medicines. Plants provide a lot of useful services to human beings. We then launched into a discussion of the morphological diversity of plants, and we talked about how we study green plants. We talked about a series of different groupings based on very major morphological features, basically two, whether they had vascular tissue and whether they produced seeds or not. Vascular tissue is very important because it was essential to be able to colonize the land, particularly parts of the land that, that are not like swamps, very moist, but drier parts of the land. Vascular tissue was an, an essential innovation in the colonization of the terrestrial environment. And we said that you can look at plants in broad categories, green algae, so we talk about the green algae and land plants as composing all green plants. Then we talked about non-vascular plants. These are plants which have now begun to colonize the terrestrial land, but they don't have vascular tissue for the transport of water, and therefore they tend to live in very moist environments and they're prostrate. They're prostrate because the other key thing that vascular tissue does for plants is to provide the structural support for plants. So you had non-vascular plants and then you had vascular, um, and these examples of non-vascular plants were liverworts, mosses, and hornworts. Then we had seedless vascular plants this is before the evolution of seed, but after the beginnings of the appearance of vascular tissue, club mosses, horsetails, and ferns, which you're all familiar with, are um, seedless vascular plants. And then we talked about the seed plants, the value of the, uh, what a seed is, an embryo, and nutritive tissue surrounding the embryo uh, is a tough, protective layer that prevents the loss of moisture and protects the seed from mechanical damage prior to its germination. We said that there are six major lineages of land plants. We're going to come back and look at pictures of them at near the end of this lecture. Um, but there are the cycads, ginkgos. There's only one living species of ginkgo, although they were once common on the earth. Other conifers, that term other, includes things like redwoods and yews, pines, neophytes, and finally the flowering plants, the angiosperms. And then we began to talk about how plants adapt to dry conditions, major innovations in land plant evolution, the first of which is the appearance of a cuticle that provides an impermeable barrier to the loss of gas from the surface of the leaf tissue. Then the cuticle first appears in algae. But it's a key innovation. We then talked about the, the stoma, which are the openings in the leaf that allow for gas exchange, because you've got to have gas exchange if you cover the leaf with a 
layer which is impermeable to gas exchange, you've got to have some other structural mechanism to allow for gas exchange in order for metabolism. And so that's the stoma. Uh, then we talked about water transport and physical support. Um, the emergence of lignin in the vessel elements as a key structural support molecule that eventually allowed the production of woody trees. So here's just a picture from, you know, to give you some idea, think about the kinds of habitats that plants now occupy. Here's a picture taken a year or so ago from the Anzabra of the Anzaborego Desert. It's only about a two mile, two, <laughs> two hour drive from here. It's a beautiful environment to visit in the spring, particularly around April. If it's been a wet winter, uh, there's a profusion of flowers that appear for a week or two before it becomes too hot again. But despite this very, very harsh environment, you see a variety of plants that have adapted to this extremely dry environment. And the big challenge for land plants and the course of evolution has been to evolve adaptations that allow them to live in ever more dry environments. And here you see in this bottom panel a lupin growing out of a, out of a granite rock. And yet it's able to subsist successfully in an extremely dry and challenging environment. So uh, today we're going to talk more about how plants reproduce in dry conditions. There are basically two problems we're going to talk about today. One is how do plants reproduce in dry conditions? What adaptations did plants evolve to allow them to reproduce successfully out of a water environment? And, the, and we'll focus on that issue. And then um, we're going to take up the diversity of plants, that, of land plants, briefly. So the, uh, <laughs> the, the key elements that had to evolve to live in a dry environment were spores that resist drying, gametes that are protected, that are produced in a multicellular protective structure that provide nutrient and protection, and finally embryos that are retained on the parent plant, once again provide nourishment and protection. Those are the key elements in plant evolution. By the way, I forgot the second point I meant to mention. The other key thing besides reproduction in the dry environment that plants had to solve was how to disperse. So, you know, plants are sessile, they're, they're anchored to the piece of ground that their roots are in. But how do they disperse? In an aqueous environment, they, they disperse through movement in the water currents and this sort of thing, so dispersal is not a problem in an aqueous environment, but it becomes a problem once plants occupy the terrestrial environment, and they do it through their propagules, through seed and through pollen. So the evolution of mechanisms to disperse seed and pollen was the other key adaptation that arose during the course of land plant evolution. Reproduction in a dry environment and dispersal in a dry environment were the two key problems. So, um, in the reproduction, the solution in part to the reproduction problem, as I've already mentioned, is to carry out the process of producing gametes in specialized structures. And these specialized structures have a name, they're called gametangia. And all of the plants, except the flowering plants, have gametangia, that, those structures are replaced by the flower and flowering plants. As uh, plants evolved, the 
but we're going to see there's a distinction between what are called homosporous and heterosporous life cycles in a moment. In the heterosporous life cycles, there are distinct structures that evolve for the, produ for the production of male gametes. They're called the antheridia versus female gametes, which are called the archegonia. And in land plants, there's a group called embryophytes, and this is where the zygote is retained on the gametophyte after fertilization, and it develops a multicellular embryo while it's attached to the parent and nourished by it. Well, this sounds pretty much like mammals, doesn't it? I mean, it's the same reproductive strategy in mammals where after fertilization, the zygote develops while it is retained on the female parent and nourished by it. So the key idea is that there are specialized structures that evolve for the production of gametes and the zygote is retained on the parent plant and nourished by it while it undergoes the initial phases of digestion, of, di of development, sorry. Um, but in the last lecture, we introduced this notion of alternation of life cycles in the context of protists. Well, plants undergo, plants have alternation of life cycles. So there, there's a haploid phase where gametophytes, these are haploid gametophytes, are produced from haploid tissue by mitosis, followed by fertilization, that is the union of the haploid gametes to form a diploid zygote followed by the development of the diploid zygote by cell division by mitosis to develop into the diploid sporophyte. The diploid sporophyte, once it's mature, produces haploid spores by meiosis. The spores divide by mitosis to develop once again into the gametophytic Phase. So there's two phases of the life cycle, a haploid phase and a diploid phase. In the haploid phase, the mature individual is the gametophyte. In the diploid phase, the mature individual is known as the sporophyte. So we already saw this in the case of protists, and this is just a recapitulation of something that we've already discussed. So beginning at the left end of the figure, we have the mature, haploid gametophyte. It's a multicellular individual. It produces gametes by mitosis because it's already haploid. Fertilization occurs, a diploid zygote results. The diploid zygote undergoes mitosis and develops into a multicellular individual that we call the sporophyte. The mature sporophyte produces spores, haploid spores by meiosis. The haploid spores now develop by mitosis back into the gametophytic generation. So this is the alteration, alternation of generations. It's a feature observed in plant, universally in plant life cycles. But there's a trend as we go from earlier plants to more recently evolved plants. In the early plants, the gametophytic, the haploid phase of the life cycle is the dominant phase, and the diploid phase is very short. As we reach the more advanced plants, starting with ferns on up through angiosperms, the, the uh, sporophytic phase is the dominant phase of the life cycle and the gametophytic phase is shorter and more reduced. So here's an example. <clears throat> 
This is an example where the haploid phase in the alternation of generations is the dominant phase. This is characteristic of mosses, so we'll use mosses as an example. We begin with the mature haploid gametophyte. It produces eggs and sperm in specialized structures. The eggs in the archegonia, the sperm in the antheridia. The sperm actually swim to affect fertilization uh, of the egg in the archegonia. So they have to be in a water medium to be able to affect fertilization. They cannot do it in the dry air. So mosses are, are dependent on a water medium, even if it's just a drop of water, to be able to affect fertilization. Then you have, after fertilization, the new zygote, which is still within the haploid maternal tissue, and it develops within the archegonian, and you continue to have this developing diploid sporophyte within this haploid tissue until you finally end up with the mature sporophyte, which is still dependent on its haploid parent. And then it undergoes meiosis and produces haploid spores, which grow by mitosis into a new gametophyte. Okay, so this is an example where the gametophytic phase of the life cycle is the dominant phase, and the, sp and the sporophytic phase of the life cycle is brief and more or less parasitic on its gametophytic parent. Now here's a fern, and it's the opposite with the ferns, the dominant phase of the life cycle, and above and beyond the ferns, more recently evolved plants, the dominant phase of the life cycle is the sporophyte. So here we have a mature diploid sporophyte. It produces spores in specialized reproductive structures called sporangia by meiosis. But now the spores can actually be dispersed by wind. The, the haploid spores undergo mitosis and land in a new environment and they uh, produce a developing haploid gametophyte, which is a relatively transient phase of the, sper of the fern life cycle. The mature gametophyte is this kind of leaf-like structure, and on the underside of it are the archegonia and antheridia, where the eggs and sperm develop. Okay, and they're shown here. Uh, you see the eggs developing in the antheridia, the sperm developing, I'm sorry, the eggs developing in the archegonia, the sperm developing in the antheridia. The sperm are still dependent on a water medium to be able to swim to the archegonian and affect fertilization. So the leaf has to be in a water medium for fertilization to happen. So up to this stage in the evolution of land plants, Reproduction depends on a water medium, right? Fertilization occurs, you've got the new zygote, which is actually maintained and develops on the tissue in the archegonium, on the tissue of the parent, and it grows by mitosis until finally you have the uh, mature gametophyte, and growing out of it you have this developing diploid sporophyte. And so that, that's the life cycle where the sporophytic phase, the diploid phase, is the dominant phase of the life cycle. This is what we see in ferns and in more recently evolved plants. But there's one more sort of complicated, uh, or it's not really complicated, it just involves some additional terminology, and that is Heterospory versus homosporous. One important innovation is heterospory 
where there's the production of two distinct types of spore producing structures. One for the male and one for the female. And we've seen this in terms of the Antheridia and Archegonia. Homosporous plants have a single type of spore that later develops into a bisexual gametophyte. So this slide just illustrates these two, this key change in the production of gametes. Homosporous individuals include non-vascular plants and most of the seedless vascular plants are homosporous. There is not a tissue do not become committed to developing into separate male and female reproductive structures early. Instead, there's a single tissue that produces a sporangium that develops spores that eventually develop into bisexual gametophytes. So the key idea is that the commitment to, to differentiation, sexual differentiation of the gametes does not occur until late in gamete production in the homosporous types. In the heterosporous types, as the name implies, the commitment to form separate re haploid reproductive structures occurs early. So the microsporangia produce microspores, the male gametophyte, and ultimately sperm. The megasporangia produce megaspores, female gametophytes, ultimately eggs. That's the heterosporous form, and that's characteristic of advanced plants. Okay, so that's the, these are the, some of the key elements of plant reproduction. So there's, as we just saw in the slide, there are two kinds of spore-producing structures in the heterosporous type. There's microsporangia, those are the spore-producing structures which will produce sperm, and there's megasporangia, the spore-producing structures which are committed to produce eggs. So the gametophytes of seed plants are either male or female, but never both, okay? So that's this sort of complex evolution of reproductive structures and plants all in a few minutes. Um, pollen. All right, well, pollen evolved when heterosporous plants lost their dependence on water for fertilization. This is a key step because up until the evolution of pollen, in order to affect fertilization, the sperm had to be able to, had to, be able to move through a water medium into the archegonia to fertilize the female egg. After the, with, with the evolution of pollen, that dependence on water disappeared, and that's a key element to being able to expand out into drier portions of the terrestrial environment. You've got to be able to successfully carry out reproduction. That's the link between generations. If you can't carry out reproduction, then you're limited to environments where it is possible to carry out reproduction. Before the evolution of pollen, they were dependent on a water medium to carry out fertilization. So pollen was one of the key steps in being able to expand into drier parts of the terrestrial environment. Another key step is the evolution of seeds. So <clears throat> seeds just allow two things. They allow they provide a pr protection and nourishment for the embryo, a packet of nourishment that allows it to get a start, but they also help solve this problem of dispersal. Now, if, if you ever wondered um, how plants manage to move out and occupy all parts of the terrestrial environment, 
they have to be able to move. And they move through this dispersion of seed. When I was early in my career, I actually taught at a university in New England, and I was always amazed and struck by the evidence of the past glaciation. If you walked through the, the woods and the landscape of New England, uh, the evidence of the glaciation was all about you, piles of gravel. Some of the islands, uh, Long Island itself is just glacial outwash. So 10,000 years ago, or 12,000 years ago, most of New England was under an ice sheet. And there was no life, no plant life, or really any other kind other than some kinds of microbial life in that environment. And yet, 10,000 years is a blink of an eye in evolutionary time, and very quickly following the re recession of the glaciers, that un appealing, dry, rocky habitat got occupied by plants. So plants move, they move fast, and they are able to adapt to environments that, that appear very inhospitable. And seed are the key element for plant movement or dispersal. They're also what we eat in many cases, in the case of grains like corn and wheat and barley and rice, we're consuming the energy in the seed that was packed away to support a developing embryo. So seeds can be dispersed by a number of mechanisms, wind, water, or animals. And the evolution of heterospory, pollen in seeds, is what triggered this dramatic radiation of seed plants beginning about 300 million years ago. Remember, before the appearance of the gymnosperms about 300 million years ago, most of the terrestrial environment was not occupied by plants because the plants that lived on the earth then, ferns, uh, horsetails, giant tree ferns and so forth were dependent on very moist swamp-like environments. So the evolution of heterospory, this reproductive strategy, pollen and seed provided the adaptations that allowed plants to spread. So just to, to get once again to look at a life cycle of heterospory, let's look at a mature pine tree. Okay, what's the mature tree? Well, it's diploid. That means it's the sporophyte, it's the diploid individual. And it happens that in pines, the reproductive, the gametes are produced in two different structures, that's heterosporous. The micro, the cones, male pollen-bearing cones with microsporangia and female ovulate cones with the megasporangia. Now taking the male side, meiosis occurs in the microsporangia producing haploid microspores which undergo mitosis to produce a male gametophyte which is the pollen grain. On the female side, the ovules are contained in the megasporangia and these develop in, <clears throat> inside a mother cell, meiosis occurs and then fertilization between the male pollen and the female gametophyte, which produce, which is occurring here within a structure called the archegonia, the part of the, fem the, the actual maternal tree. Fertilization occurs followed by mitosis and the embryo develops on the maternal tree as a diploid individual, seed are produced, which encapsulate the embryo, 
The seed are dispersed in the environment. They germinate as a developing diploid sporophyte and grow into the mature tree. So that's the cycle. It's the same cycle, but in the pine, once again, the sporophytic stage is the dominant stage, and the gametophytic stage is the shorter, more transient stage of the life cycle in this alternation of generations. Okay, so, so much for the solving the reproductive problem and the dispersal problem. Now let's talk a little bit about the structures that we see in angiosperms. Angiosperms are the most abundant plants on the earth. They're the flowering plants. They're the ones that we um, love for their beautiful flowers that you can you know, send roses on Valentine's Day, which is coming up. And, uh, uh, there are many uses that we make of, of flowers and flowering plants. You know that the, the horticultural industry just here in Southern California is worth about a billion dollars a year. Just an industry producing flowering plants for horticulture, for, or, for ornamental uses, or for flowers, or in some cases for agricultural uses. So there are about 250,000 described angiosperm species. And the success of the angiosperms, remember the angiosperms first appear in the fossil record about 150 million years ago, and then they become the dominant plant form on most of the earth. Um, the boreal forests and so forth are largely gymnosperms, pines and conifers, but elsewhere it's the flowering plants which are really the dominant plant form. And <clears throat> Their success depends upon the evolution of this reproductive structure called the flower. And the flower has two key structures within it. One are the stamens, which contain the male reproductive structures. That's you know, the anthers that shed the pollen and so forth that you observe when you look at a flower. And the other is the carpal, which is really an enfolded leaf structure that contains the ovary. And this is where the ovules are formed and the ovules contain the megasporangia, which produce the haploid ovule, which is available for fertilization. So the evolution of the flower is just one more elaboration of this heterospory. So flowers are wonderful, they vary in size, uh, they vary in odor, they're, they're appealing and attractive to human beings, but what value are they to the plant other than containing the reproductive structures? Well, one of the things about flowering plants that's really fascinating is that they use this flower, this reproductive structure, as a way, uh, in many cases, not in all, but in many cases as a way of manipulating other species to affect fertilization for them. So very showy and attractive flowers have evolved along with insect pollinators because they appeal to different species of insects as a way of getting the insect to visit the flower and carry its pollen to other flowers to affect fertilization. So it's a fascinating and complicated interdependence that has evolved with the flower, where the flower is the structure that manipulates other organisms to carry out part of the reproductive function of the plant. It's not only insects, but uh, mammals like bats sometimes are the agents of fertilization or birds like hummingbirds. Um, so there are a wide variety of different animal species which actually are manipulated into providing this key reproductive service. The evolution of the flower then made for efficient pollin pollination. So the other thing that, that evolved with the flowering plants are fruit. Now, 
we consume fruit and many other animals consume fruit. So fruit have a real value to us and it's just a structure that's derived from the ovary and encloses one or more seeds. So think of the avocado fruit as kind of an interesting example. It's a big fruit with uh, uh, nutritious endosperm, a nutritious material surrounding the seed, and this giant seed, very large seed, single seed in the fruit. And we, and before us, other animals consume the fruit because it provides nutrition to us and we disperse the seeds in the process. So once again, uh, in many cases, the seed are an adaptive structure that manipulates other species into carrying out this dispersal. And they manipulate other species by providing nutrient material that the other species can use um, as they move the seed about. So the evolution of seed facilitated efficient seed, uh, efficient dispersal. The evolution of fruit, I'm sorry, the evolution of fruit facilitated efficient seed dispersal. So here's, so let's go back again to one of these phylogenies and now map on the phylogeny where each of these key innovations occurred during the evolution of plants. So if, if we look here um, at the base of the algae and land plants, we see the evolution of simple gametangia, structures for the production of gametes, and then followed soon after that, the retention of the egg on the parent, on the maternal parent, to provide protection and nutrition while the egg develops. And then right after the lineage that leads to all land plants separates from the algae, thick-walled spores appear, which are adapted better to dry environments Complex gametangia for the development of the gametes appear. The retention of the embryo on the parent and then the alternation of generations. All before the lineages that, that lead to the earliest land plant lineages, the liverworts, hornworts, and mosses diverge. After the divergence of the liverworts, hornworts, and mosses, these are the non-vascular plants, but before the appearance of the seedless vascular plants, a sporophyte-dominated life cycle begins to appear. Remember we saw the example in ferns, which, which represent the seedless vascular plants. After the seedless vascular plants have separated, but before the gymnosperms and angiosperms appear, heterospory, pollen, and seed all, of, all appear as innovations in evolution. Then we have the gymnosperms, and finally in the angiosperms, the appearance of flowers and fruit. So that's the the temporal sequence of the evolution of these key adaptations, adaptations that allow for reproduction on the land in a dry environment and adaptations that allow for the dispersal of individuals, that allow plants to move in space and occupy much of the terrestrial environment. Okay, so for the last few minutes, we're just gonna kind of quickly look through some of the key lineages of green plants. Now remember the term green plants, as we introduced it uh, a lecture ago, is the green algae plus the land plants, okay? So we're gonna start with the green algae, and here we have the evolution of the cuticle, stoma, 
<clears throat> Early in the evolution of green plants, the evolution of the cuticle, remember the cuticle is that waxy covering over the external leaf or other structures that prevent gaseous exchange and therefore the loss of water vapor, allowing plants to begin to live on land. So we have the cuticle, the stomata, and then later water conducting tissue. Once the green plants were on land, then we have the beginnings of the evolution of these more complicated reproductive structures that make reproduction successful in dry environments. And that's gametangia, embryos retained on the parent, pollen seeds, and flowers. So first, let's look at the green algae. And we'll just see a, a little bit of picture of so the, the first lineage of the green algae to break off is the ovocytes, followed by the coleochaetes, and then the stoneworts. So here's an example of the ovocyte. It's, <clears throat> they're primary producers, and they live solely in an aquatic environment. The coleochaetes, these are just thin sheets of cells, so they're multicellular, but they're thin, sheets of cells in an aqueous environment. And then finally, the sister group to the land plants, the green algal group called the karyophase, or stoneworts, uh, are multicellular. Some species can actually be quite large, more than a meter in length. They're freshwater algae, Good indicator that water is not polluted. And as I've already mentioned, they're the sister group to the land plants. So after that, the land, the, so this is, this is a stonewort. The sister group to the land plants. And then we go on in the beginnings of the occupation of the terrestrial environment with the non-vascular plants, the bryophytes. The, uh, these are the most basal, that is the bottom lineage in the evolutionary sequence of land plants. They grow low to the ground, they don't have vascular tissue, so they have no structural support. And there are three living evolutionary lineages the liverworts, the mosses, and the hornworts, and they all look like they separated at about the same point in time. So this is an example of a polytomy. Remember we introduced that term polytomy early in the lectures. And then we have, so here's the mosses, common in moist forests, uh, abundant in extreme environments, they can dry out and then rehydrate in the presence of water. Most don't grow taller than just a few centimeters because they lack vascular tissue. And here's just some examples of mosses. On the right is a panel of mosses in wet weather, and here are dehydrated mosses in dry weather, but they can rehydrate. Then we go to the liverworts. These are common in damp forest floors, riverbanks, and so forth. Uh, they can grow on dry rock or bare rock and tree bark. And they contribute to the initial stages of soil formation. So these are, a, this is a picture of the liverworts. And then we have the hornworts. Some species of hornworts harbor symbiotic cyanobacteria, so they can fix nitrogen because, they, because of the symbiotic association with a bacterium, a cyanobacterium. And this is a picture of hornworts. Right, then we have the seedless vascular plants. All of them have conducting tissues that are reinforced with lignin. Remember, lignin is the molecule that provides the structural strength and support in vessels. The seedless vascular plants depend on water for reproduction. Their gametes, the sperm, have to swim through a water medium, so they can't live in dry conditions. But uh, there are tree-sized lycophytes and horsetails in the fossil record. They were important in the Carboniferous era, 
when coal was laid down. So here we come to examples. Here's a, a lycophyte living today a, called Lycopodium. Some of you may be familiar with it. The, the whisk ferns, there's only six species of whisk ferns known to be living today and they live only in tropical regions. They're simple morphologically and lack both leaves and roots. So they're in the early stage in uh, colonization of the terrestrial environment. All right, then the psilophytes, again, very, very simple morphologically. Finally, the horsetails. There are only 15 species of horsetails which are known today. And their name, their common name, horsetail, comes from the structural brushy experience, uh, appearance that they have. They live in wet habitats, such as stream banks and marsh edges. And um, so here's a picture of a horsetail. So, so that's the seedless vascular plants. Or, well, then we go to the ferns, which are also seedless. Um, there are many species of ferns known today, more than 12,000. They're particularly abundant in the tropics. Um, some of them can be very tall, 20 meters or more. I don't know if any of you have seen these giant fern trees, but uh, they're common in some tropical areas. They're, they're a remarkable organism to be able to see. So they're the only seedless vascular plants that have large, well-developed leaves. And this is an example of ferns. And there's some tree ferns in the right-hand panel. And then we get to the seed plants. Okay, there's, seed plants are a monophyletic group that, <clears throat> that include the ancestral, the ancestor and all of its descendant, descendant lineages is a monophyletic group. Seed plants are monophyletic. They consist of the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. And they're defined by the production of seed and pollen grains. And here we have the seed plants. And remember, I, I listed off the six groups at the beginning, cycads, ginkgo, only one species of ginkgo, redwoods and yews, nitophytes, pines, and finally angiosperms, the flowering plants. So cycads. Um, these were very abundant, 150 to about 65 million years ago. Now they're only about 140, million, 140 species. Most of them live in the tropics. Um, they harbor a large number of symbiotic nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria. So once again, they're important uh, because of their symbiotic relationship to nitrogen fixation. Here's cycads. All right, ginkgo. There's only one living species of ginkgo today. Unlike most uh, gymnosperms, the ginkgo is deciduous. That means it loses its leaves seasonally, which is an unusual feature. And this is a picture of the ginkgo. And you see them as ornamental plants. Nidophytes, 70 species. This is a very strange one called Welwichia, which lives in the deserts. Gymnosperms which are common on the earth. You see the two kinds of cones, the pollen-bearing and the seed-bearing cones. And finally, the angiosperms, 250,000 known species, key adaptations, two groups, monocots and dicots. Okay, that's, that's it. <laughs> Good luck on your midterm.